Good morning, sir. My name is Ampogod Olisa, and I've been hearing so much about Ten String Music Institute, and I'm here to ask you some questions about it. Ah, uh, good morning. Nice to have you here. Ah, uh, I'm ready to answer all of your questions, so okay. you can please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you tell us the reason why you started Ten String Music Institute? Uh, before starting Ten Strings Music Institute, I was uh, a music teacher with a number of uh, schools, primary, secondary schools, and some music schools. My last place of work, where I worked for four years, was with uh, Wally Adenuga Productions, uh, PEFTI, Pencils Film and Television Institute, and I was the um, music instructor there and in all of my years of teaching there were serious questions students came up to ask me after the class uh, there were demands that students uh, made that were a bit difficult to execute in the classroom based on the curriculum and the um, set up so for instance students will come and say i want to be uh, a reggae artist i want to do afrobeat i want to do r b and can our classes do songs that are tailored in this way that can help me achieve my dream but then the course outline i have states that you do this beethoven you do this Mozart, you do this European music, classical music. Most music school uh, around the world would at some point or mostly use classical music uh, for your coursework. So that was a major problem. So my biggest uh, my biggest query at that point was, is it possible to have a music school where what the student wants to learn what the student wants to achieve in their future is what we teach in the classroom a lot of music graduates then would finish music school but most times when they appear on the stage it's extremely strange to them the smoke and the light and the sound it never happens during your education okay. so the concept of 10 strings was to have a music school where you are as familiar as possible with the realities of the music industry. So we simulate, we create the music industry experience during your education. So in 2007, when I decided to do this, I didn't have anything. I was only an employee in a couple of places earning one or two salaries. What would you say have been your challenges so far running this music institute? Okay, I would like to start from establishing it okay uh, so the number one challenge was the fact that i had a vision which is establish a music school where the focus will be on the student's dream and helping them realize it but i had no time to start or establish anything uh, so the first challenge i had to overcome was how to um, turn that dream into reality and I think a lot of young people usually face this challenge you look at your life and say I do not have anything because at that time all that I was doing was teaching music here and there playing as an instrumentalist in this church you earn this little money earn that little money so I was nowhere near being a founder but you will know at some point when the time for a vision has come. You can have a dream and then you have a vision, you have plans, but if day comes, you wake up and you feel like that day is the first day of that vision. The first day it must come to life. That day do not waste the opportunity. Stand up, knock on every door, you can knock in the world because that feeling doesn't come that easily. 
that day when you wake up and feel like the time for this vision has come. So I stood up and I walked up to people who had facilities, who were giants in the music industry. I shared my vision with a number of people and I met someone who was willing to give their space to say, we'll give you a try, come start here in this space. Uh, you know, so I overcame that by standing up and knocking on doors uh, that can offer support or collaboration to get that vision started. The number two challenge when we started was, how do you get students? So I learned the biggest lesson of my life as a, as a businessman uh, through that experience. People do not buy what you are selling. People buy what other people are buying. Because a lot of people who walked into the music school, when we started, they saw the setup, they could see the passion in me, and I was extremely good at what I was doing. I played five musical instruments, I could train the voice. At that point, I had taught in several places successfully. But they were not convinced because there were no other, there were no other students. People will not buy what you're selling because it's good. They want to buy because others are buying it so it's a social uh, buying or selling it's a social activity it's not it's not a decision someone makes based on need so it was very difficult to get in an entire year we enrolled three students two children and one adult so that was the biggest challenge so but how do you overcome that Number one rule is consistency. Okay. So you manage to pull from that two to three and to four and to five and to six. The day somebody walks into the music school to make inquiries and sees six students, they begin to have that proof of concept that yes, it's like this place has come to stay. So if you cannot endure your first year, you will never have a second year. If you cannot endure because nobody is coming, nobody, nobody is buying, nothing is happening in your business, then there will never be a second year for you. So every time you're going through a very difficult time at the start of your business, at the start of your vision, you must understand that that, is, that in itself is a requirement for a second year to come. And when a second year comes for you, it will always be better than the first one. So we overcame that by deciding to say we would sit down on ground here and make this work. So in the first year, like I mentioned, we had just three students. People were walking in and walking out because we just started. Second year, we enrolled more than 50 to 100, there about up to 100 students. You can imagine three to 100. Okay, I want to ask a question. You said within a year you had just three students. Three students in one full year. How did that make you feel? Because you have this vision and people don't really see things from your point of view and they decided not to come to your music institute. How did that make you feel having just three students and knowing you have a bright vision for music? Well, I would advise that anything you want to start in your life, let it not just be a business idea. I'm starting this because I would make money from it. Okay. So I had my other jobs going on. I was working in a, in a church as music director part-time. I was having one or two private lessons where I go home to teach. I still had one or two primary schools where I was teaching. I kept my pefty job intact. So little, that little pay that was consistent Okay. before I started the school kept on going on so I would usually advise a young person when you're starting your business in the first year do not quit every source of income so at that point I wasn't just running the music school because I, I wanted a source of income to sustain myself essentially I wanted to I'm a very uh, curious person I'm an adventurous person how will this end I started this because Everywhere I had taught music, students complained about the style and approach. They wanted a platform where they can experience the music industry. But the curriculums did not accommodate it. So I wanted 
as a maybe you say a little bit of a stubborn person a non-conformist can we start a music school where it's as if we're running a music industry so i wanted to see so curiosity can keep you for a while in your business and also um that point of running your business where your your dream is not just about the money it gives to you but you want to see it happen i don't know if you get my point talk about fulfillment yes fulfillment and the needs to see it happen the joy of doing it knowing that this is going to be for this is going to be for all my life why should i give up in the first one year it's like your child has not started talking in the first one year or in the first uh she's not making sound she's not walking yet there will always be that hope if you know that this child is not meant to just be in your life for five years this child is meant to be in your life forever so I, that i wasn't that much in a hurry and i was um i was doing it for the experiment like i want to see how this goes and that kept me going okay, okay can you tell us like how you mentioned about teaching in an industry style would you like say that sets you apart from other music institutes yes today 10th street is uh, structured to resemble a music industry itself so when you come in the goal is for you to learn as an apprentice as an intern not as a student so we do very little of writing uh, exam and all those academic stuff so it's more and practical than theoretic yes yes it's not it's, it's not a conventional uh music school okay uh the goal is you come in and by the time you're going out and you decide to start your career in the industry the industry appears very familiar to you but i must say i must tell you the very setback to that approach so I do not blame music schools who do not approach, who do not adopt this. It's extremely expensive to run. You have to keep updating your instrument. You have to make sure they are functional. I'm always fighting with managers or instructors. If I get into a campus and I see one piano is not working, one guitar, no. Imagine this place is supposed to be a stage where people are performing. You can't put a piano that is not working on the stage. Say, ah, no, sir, actually, uh, it, just happened, it just happened yesterday and we have seven more keyboards here that we're using. No, everything must work because picture this classroom as a performance stage and everybody coming to learn here are going to perform on the stage. Everything must work. So maintenance cost is extremely high. At 10 strings, everything works. And also the shows in themselves, the programs you are creating, cost a lot of money. An average student did not come into the school to pay you to do them, to do a wants to watch, uh, to do a 10 strings Joma, a Freedom Fest, a master class. You don't have to, that's the truth. But this program costs us more money than running the school itself. But we haven't given up on doing that in 17 years because we know that we will be deceiving ourselves to run a music school that is completely detached from the realities of the music industry. Okay. Um, I wonder, how do you think the music industry has been like when you started 17 years ago as compared to now? Like what is the difference between the music industry in Nigeria then and now? The music industry in Nigeria 17 years ago when we started 10 Strings, okay. the biggest challenge that the, is that the average young person who wanted to pursue a career in music did not have the confidence to say, I want to pursue music. There were no enough role models. We had people like Remedies, Two Face Edibia, Sound Sultan, and others. But the kind of fame and success that today's generation, the Brunner Boys and Whiskeys and Rema, and uh, Olamide and the rest enjoy the sort of success was not there. Those artists were really, really struggling. I grew up in First Act, where a lot of times I would bump into uh, someone I'm watching on TV, you know, on that very hot sun, you know, just hustling around. It was a big war to approve of your child saying, I want to pursue a career in music. 
But today we have lots, lots of role models in Nigeria who are doing this extremely well. And all of the things that people would say, oh, if you pursue a music career, your life will be destroyed. You're going to be into drugs. You're going to end up this and that. It's not really happening. We have people in the music industry, young people who started from 18. Today, they are 38 or 40 and they are okay. They are not in rehab home, so things have become a bit easier and it's also the, the path to success has become a bit easier. 17 years ago, you needed somebody to finance. You needed somebody, you needed a record label to sign you before you can do anything, before you can become anything. Today, you can go into a, a cheap studio or on your laptop and a sound card and your headphone, create something and put it on Spotify. If it sounds good, you might wake up to a million streams tomorrow yeah. and you get paid for it. So it has become better over the years. And so um, for us as a music school too, it can only get better. Now that students can now have someone to look up to, now that the industry is a bit clearer, then you can have more people enrolling in the school. Okay, how do you support your students' artistic works and development outside the classroom? Okay, so beyond our regular shows and programs okay. and the opportunities we give to them, uh, recently Ten Strings has also registered Ten Strings Records and Tours, which we are currently financing okay. and building its capacity. The goal is to take some of our finest talents further refine them, uh, record them, and help them launch into the market and also get them to tour the world, take them to festivals in and out of Africa. Um, because I would boldly tell you that Ten Strings has the largest collection of music talents in Africa. If you come to any campus of Ten Strings and hear people sing, hear people play, and you really want to help. A lot of times I walk into a Ten Strings campus and I hear people sing, I, I see people produce or something, I'll be like, if I had all of the funds in the world, I'll take all of them and just push them there, support them and help them from this school to the global stage. So, that has stopped to be a dream now. So we're putting money where our money, where our heart is. So we're going to be on our platform on Ten Strings Records and Tour. If you check tenstringsmusic.com, that's the company website for Ten Strings Records and Tour. We would be recording and promoting uh, a number of our students annually and then helping them to plug into festivals around the world. And we hope as time goes on, we can scale it to cover as many as possible uh, young people. Some other challenges that we have experienced uh, running this uh, have to do with the environment in which we find ourselves. We are operating a music uh, institution in a country that does not see and well the country I mean the government the leaders do not see the potential in music as a business or even as a tool for nation building the federal government of Nigeria has almost zero equity in today's music industry and regardless of all of the success we can point at to say the music industry is experiencing today the government cannot boldly take credit for anything so we've run this for 17 years in 17 years we have become nigeria's largest music school and in these 17 years, not a dime from any kind of government, federal, state, local government has been granted. Not one student has been brought to us to say, this student is talented, um, 
but has no um, opportunity to pay for music education. We are paying for him or her. Nothing like that has ever happened. So a system that has zero support for the arts is a very hostile environment to build talents. And so I would give you another instance. Would you believe that 10 strings is arguably the school, the Nigerian school with the highest international students? In 17 years, we have enrolled students from 20 countries in and out of Africa. One of the biggest challenges we have every year is getting our students' visa to come in. There are, there are students who have paid tuition fees before, who tried their best to get a visa to come study in Nigeria. For one reason or the other, it's taken forever. They had to ask for their refunds. So it is generally known that Nigerian high commissions and embassies abroad are some of the toughest places to get a visa. So imagine you have a local school that a lot of students are interested in coming to study in, but getting them visas to study here sometimes can take six months after application. Sometimes some of the embassies, especially outside, out, uh, outside of Africa, do not even have a provision for a student visa. So they don't even understand what, is, what the prospective student is asking for. So this is, a this is a setback that has to do with the environment. Another setback is spending almost 70% of your income on power generation. The power situation over the last 10 years has been experiencing a consistent decline. So some of our campuses today run on uh, fuel 90% of the time spent in the school you're burning fuel if you put that funds for maintaining generator buying a new generator uh, buying fuel annually you will be amazingly shocked how much that comes to and how much impact the school could have made with that so the environment here in one of the setbacks. But regardless of all of these challenges, Ten Strings has done tremendously well. We started in Festa Town in 2007, and by 2010, we opened in Suruleri. By 2012, we were in Ikeja, and then we opened in Ikoroju, opened in Aja, opened in Portacourt, opened in Abuja, you know, and a couple of other campuses here and there. Uh, we are the only music school in Nigeria, regardless of the fact that we have never been given a dime of scholarship or funding or grants that has grown this much. And today, enrolling students from 20 other countries. So now imagine having that support. Now imagine our campuses can run on regular government power supply. Imagine that, what we could have done with music. We believe that music is that gift that keeps giving. Music is such a powerful tool that can change Nigeria, that can change Africa, that can inspire young people. We believe at Ten Strings Music Institute that music is the next gold, is the next oil and gas. If you look at what is happening, in today's music industry, the potential is unbelievable. There are Nigerian artists today who charge $2 million per show. Some charge $500,000 when they go abroad to travel. So why don't we come together and replicate to say as a nation, we want to build 50 more Bronner Boy, 10 more Whiskey, 20 more Tiwa Savage. Why don't we consciously? The Nigerian Afrobeat is one of the fastest growing music in the world, if not the fastest at the moment, spreading like wildfire. Have you ever heard any government official in this country saying 
we recognize this new trend, this new potential, this new addition to our GDP. And we are going to scale it. We are going to expand this. We are going to harness it. So this is the biggest challenge and setback for the industry. And we're not going to give up. We're going to continue to push until the creative sector and the music industry in particular in Nigeria becomes one of our best best developed industry okay what would you say is the biggest lesson you've learned while on the job ah, the biggest lesson I've learned on the job is apart from the one I mentioned before that people do not buy what you're selling because they need it okay. it's a social decision buying what you're selling is a social decision who is buying it what's the story around it what have you done before so as a seller you have to consciously know that this decision to come to your school goes beyond the fact that you're teaching well the school is a good school you have to push the word out there you have to create a social impact around what you do other lessons that I've learned is that we belong to a society that does not value music. Today, if you go for an event and they ask you, what do you do? And you say, um, I'm a musician and you're not a uh, Rema or Thames. They ask you, and so what else do you do? So for a long time in my career with all of the hard work and pain and stress, People did, didn't think that I was using, I was putting my life into something. So one of the lessons I learned earlier on is that do not draw your validation, do not draw your sense of fulfillment from third party validation. There are a lot of things you will do with your life. You waking up in the morning, coming back late at night, people will look at you and feel that you're wasting your life. If you ever look out for validation to confirm that what you're doing is worth the while, then you are always going to be filled with regret, especially if you're in the creative sector. So for a long time ago, I realized that, that I must draw my sense of fulfillment. I have built a music school from being son of a nobody. When I mean nobody, I mean from a very humble beginning to that school becoming the largest music school in Nigeria and touching over 25,000 lives in the last 17 years. I would be foolish today to sit back and say my, my source of fulfillment is the validation from people. I should be, you should be able to look at your life from time to time and give yourself credit and draw your deep joy from the sense that you have used, you've spent your life doing the things that matter to you. Earlier on in my career, that was a big problem. Family did not even believe. People ridiculed me uh, that this brilliant kid all of a sudden wants to waste his life saying he wants to be a music teacher. So uh, we, we, I, I told a friend recently, I said, we're not living our lives just to meet up with social standards or to make a certain amount of money. You're living your life to fulfill your God-given purpose. If you're doing that, it's a matter of time, money will follow. Okay, so another great secret of success uh, would be the teams I have worked with over the years. I've worked with some amazing people. I still work with amazing people. They take the job like, this is what they were born to do. Without that, we wouldn't be able to scale beyond one campus because I wouldn't be able to be physically in all of them. So over the years, I would say, uh, I'm grateful for some great human beings that have been on my team. Uh, also, I would say my focus as a, as a person, I'm not easily distracted. If I put my mind to something, if I tell myself this is the next thing I'm doing, until that thing is done, I don't take my mind from it. I am extremely focused um, and I'm a goal getter. If I fail, let it be that I've tried my best and it didn't work. So I put my eyes on the mark and make sure it's done. 
and also I have a very solid level of um, financial discipline. So a lot of the times that we've opened a new campus, it's like I just look at, oh, we have these funds. We have this money that just came in. I could take that money and go do something as a young person, just have some fun, just buy a new car or just gratify myself. But in 17 years, almost everything that comes into the business goes back into the business. So like I mentioned before, we've never got grants, we've never got any sponsorship or funding from anyone, and I'm saying this openly. So every, everything you see at 10 Strings comes from the fees that students pay. We reinvest it back to grow the business and make sure everything runs well. So that takes a lot of discipline. So uh, ability to prioritize well, ability to delay gratification and look at the very little we have and deploy it the right way. I think I would say this has contributed to the growth of the business over the years. Okay, what is your plan for 10 String Music Institute in this year 2024? In this year 2024, we're going to do some of the things we've never done before. Uh, one of them is that we're planning, planning to sh uh, shoot our very first uh, musical, a music film where we will tell the story of Afrobeat with plenty of music in between. Uh, this year we are also scaling to open more branches. We'll be, we're currently speaking with the government of Lagos State in collaboration with PMAN uh, to help us identify, empower and showcase talents at the community level. So we're starting with Lagos. All major communities across the state want to create a program that we pull out these talents and then start to empower them. Like I mentioned, the music industry now should no longer be seen as a means of entertainment or a hobby or something that jobless youths do. It is now the new oil and gas for Nigeria. Considering how much a successful artist earn now from their acts. So it's an economic empowerment. It's an addition to the country's GDP. So we want to collaborate with uh, key partners and stakeholders to identify music talent, train them quickly, launch them into the music industry, promote them and help them earn a uh, sustainable income from using their talent. So that's the project we're backing on. Uh, most definitely we're starting in Lekki. We're opening a new campus in phase one. We used to be in Lekki phase one, but now we're in Aja. Uh, but we still have complaints from students around Ikoyi, Phase 1, and um, VI that Ajay is too far from them. We used to have a center that we shut it down during COVID and focus on just one center. And since after COVID, we haven't opened back. So we're going to open a new center back in Phase 1. We are also going to open in Ibadan this year. This year, I'm also uh, starting two podcasts. One is a talk show. Uh, if you check the banner, uh, you see the creative career circle with Akaku Emmanuel. I'll be doing it here and this that's what all this are meant for. Sharing with young people my experience in the creative career, the good, the bad, the ugly, how to survive it, how to win in life. That's what the podcast is about. And um, a live music podcast, helping young people to create music. So it's like a songwriting uh, podcast pick a song from scratch, we create instrumentals to it, um, guide you on how to sing it well. So you showcase the entire craft of music making from the point of writing to the point of performance, recording and all that. That's what that podcast is about. We're also starting this, that, starting that this year. Uh, and a couple of other amazing projects. Yes, I also need to mention, in 2024, we're launching our online school which I'm extremely excited about. I mentioned before that we are having a major challenge with students who want to come and learn in Nigeria, yeah. but they are having visa issues. We want to create uh, 10 strings courses online and get students to tap into them from wherever you are. So that mobile app and the website is currently being developed and we are recording those courses to upload them. So for me, this is the, in the last 10 years, this is my most exciting news because with that students from around the world can connect to what we do 
and we can reach more people. Um, but overall, what the future holds for 10 strings okay. is tied to our dream for music industry in Nigeria. We want to see the music industry become a major contributor to national GDP. We want to see a, very, a thriving music industry. And I always use Australia, for example. 20% of Australian population work in the music industry. 20%, that means two out of 10 people earn money in the music industry. Because this is a country that woke up one day and said, come, music is bigger than just something you dance to enjoy yourself. It's a proper, proper industry. As big as oil and gas is in, on, uh, on Nigeria's uh, GDP, we cannot say 20% of people can, are, are working there. So it's not, it's not providing that much job. So if we harness music, at least 10% of people in this country will earn directly and indirectly from it. So we want to have a successful music industry. So one of the ways we can do it is to identify really talented people. I'm telling you, if you go to some very poor communities, rural communities, and hear people sing or play the drums or dance, you'll be like, wow. You shouldn't be locked up in this village with nobody knowing what you have. So our dream is to go into these remote villages, communities, other states that are unreached, um, get these talents, discover them, and with the help and support of local partners in that community, give them a push out there. Let's make the business of raising and building talent a national business. A, a business of high importance. So when we discover this talent, empower them and let Nigeria and other African countries, of course. So we're going to be taking some giant steps. The one I forgot to mention is that we are, will be launching our first set of artists under 10 Strings Records and Tours um, later this year. Uh, at least four of them for a start that we would truly, truly, genuinely invest in, support them, help them uh, develop their acts beyond what happens in the classroom. Help them launch into the market, help them get shows locally and internationally and set them on a path of career freedom for life. So we would be doing that. In fact, we started that. We took one of our recording studios, which is uh, one in Agege, and we've been spending money to make sure it is perfect for all kinds of recording. By the time we're finally done and it's fully set, in the next two weeks we're actually done, we would start the recording project. Albums, EPs, for a number of talents. We'll record for up to eight. So we can now pick the very best four and say, okay, these four, uh, let us see how we can raise some funds and support you to push you out there. So those are things to look out for in 2024. Let's us be the largest supplier of talent to the world. It's possible because we are an extremely talented people. But I tell you, less than 1% of the talent that Nigeria has is being discovered. Less than 1% for every uh, terms, for every two-face Idibia, for every Bonner boy, you have at least 1,000 people better than them that nobody has ever heard about. That's the heartbreaking part. So the number one mission of 10 Strings is to find this talent, empower them, support them for the world to get to know them. So that's what the future holds. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a great uh, interview session with you. And uh, it was a pleasure, great one, sharing uh, the vision and the journey with you.